We have love in us, but if you don't love yourself, you're not receiving that love. And I'm not talking about being in love with yourself and selfish and self-centered. I'm talking about loving the you that God created you to be. Stop talking to yourself about all the stuff that stress you out and start talking to God. Talking to yourself won't do anything, but talking to God will. Causes for stress. I have 16. <laughs> and I could have kept going, so you know. I'll try not to get hung up too much on these points, so we'll just go through them pretty fast. Guilt, that's a bad one. Hidden sin, poor diet. I decided yesterday, I was tired. I've been working a little more than I like to lately. and I was real tired. You know, sometimes when you're real tired, you want to do something you shouldn't do. Anybody ever notice that? And so I decided that I wanted dessert, and I wanted a lot of it. <laughs> and to maintain my size, I have to be, you know, pretty strict. And so I decided I was going to eat dessert and not eat food. <laughs> I didn't tell you. I didn't tell you because I knew you wouldn't like it. So... I got a cookie and I put all this icing on it. And then I had a little ice cream. It was a little bowl of ice cream, but put chocolate sauce on that. And I, I ate that dessert and didn't eat any food. And I got so nervous. It just, the sugar just made me nervous. And I felt terrible after that. Well, how many people are stressed out all the time <clears throat> just because they have a lousy diet. They don't do something like that occasionally. They eat junk every day. <laughs> well, you got a good church. They don't have a problem with anything. <laughs> I have never seen so many people that can look innocent as this group. <laughs> I mean, they're all just... <laughs> How many of you don't get enough sleep? You know what? I've got an answer for you. Go to bed at night. <laughs> this really isn't rocket science. How many of you don't drink enough water? Drink some water. <laughs> you know, we look for all these complicated answers to what we think are all these complicated problems, and to be honest, it's really not that hard. I was having stomach problems every single morning I was being sick to my stomach. Not like throwing up sick, but just nauseated and just bleh. And so I've learned that if you ask God, he will tell you some things. And so I was asking God to give me a word of knowledge, show me what's wrong. And I had these, I had, I have little bit of irritable bowel syndrome, and so I looked on the internet to see what irritated it, and the number one thing on the list was xylitol, and I had these mints that I ate probably a package and a half of every day, and the number one ingredient was xylitol. So I quit eating the mints, and I quit having the stomach problem. So just some of you, not all of you, but some of you that feel bad, even, even stress. You know, one of the things that will give you stress is doing things that God has not anointed you to do. Now, my husband is, I, sometimes I wonder if Dave even knows what stress is. I mean, he's just very peaceful. You know, easiest guy in the world to get along with. Very patient, very generous in forgiveness, kind. He just is very, just not stressful. And uh, he was having what he calls the yips, <laughs> which was really just, he was, he was 
felt stressed. He was shaken inside, you know, like inside. Well, he found out he was doing something that he'd been doing for a long time, but God didn't want him doing it anymore. And it took our daughter, recognized it and shared with him. And he stopped doing it. The yips went away. So maybe you're just doing some things that God's no longer anointing you to do. And that's giving you stress. Now, I was abused sexually by my dad from the time I was a little, little bitty. And uh, so I grew up with stress. I had stress all my life. I had so much stress, I didn't even know it was stress. So I was always going to the doctor because when you have stress, it'll affect your health. Trying to find out what was wrong with me and then they would tell me it was stress and that would make me mad <laughs> because I didn't even understand what stress was. I thought stress meant you couldn't handle life. And I'm a strong woman. I can handle life. I do not have stress. Don't tell me I have stress. <laughs> this is not stress. I even had one doctor tell me to go see a psychiatrist. I had one ask me if I wanted to come to these classes that he was doing on changing your thinking. I thought, I wrote the book. <laughs> he said, you're having a battle in your mind. I thought, I've sold six million copies of that book. Well, if nothing else, you're getting a good laugh tonight. <laughs> Not enough exercise. Oh, don't talk to me about exercise, Joyce. Okay. Unresolved issues from the past. You know, it's our secrets that make us sick. You know that? No wonder the Bible says, confess your faults to one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Sometimes you just need to sit down with somebody you can trust and just say, I just, I just need to get some things out in the open. It's not, I mean, you don't need to go to a person to get forgiveness. But sometimes we do just need to vent. We just need to talk to somebody, not to complain or grumble, but just to get rid of it. Fear being codependent. If you're a person who's married to somebody that's hard to get along with and you have to wait to see what kind of mood they're in before you decide what kind of mood you're in, that's being codependent. I had a lot of problems when Dave and I first got married from being abused and Dave tried for a long time to make me happy and I didn't know how to be happy and he finally said, I don't care what I do, you're not going to be happy, so I'm finished trying. But he said, I am going to enjoy my life. And oh, that made me mad. <laughs> made me so mad because people that aren't happy don't want other people to be happy. But you know, that was one of the best things that he ever did for me. He didn't become codependent on me. He didn't let my mood ruin his mood. He didn't let my lack of joy take his lack of joy. And you know, I don't have time to get into all these things that I would love to get into because it's taken me a lifetime to learn them. But if you are in relationship with somebody, whether it's a real good friend or a parent or a spouse or a child that is determined to be unhappy, don't let them steal your joy because you are not helping them by doing that. Actually, what eventually happened was when Dave persisted in being happy, he finally made me hungry for what he had. So it actually really helped me in the long run, same way with his peace. He modeled peace in front of me, and I finally thought, well, if he can have that, I can have that. Amen. So it, it doesn't help a person with problems if you let their problems determine how you're going to live your life. He loved me. He said, I, I love you. 
but I'm not going to let you make me unhappy. Come on, somebody here needs to hear that. Now, I always say Dave kind of got what he deserved because when he met me, I was washing my mother's car in short shorts, and he pulled up to pick up the guy he was going somewhere with that rented my mom and dad's upstairs flat, and he tried to flirt with me, and I didn't trust men, didn't like men, and I said, well, I liked men, but I didn't trust them. And I said, he said, hey, when you're finished washing that car, you want to wash mine? I said, if you want your car washed, buddy, wash it yourself. <laughs> well, he'd been praying for a wife, and boy, he made a mistake. He said, God, make it somebody that needs help. <laughs> Honestly, that's what he prayed. La da. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't feel sorry for him. He got what he asked for. Another real stressor is people. You know, I used to be, you know, I, I can be really happy till the people come. <laughs> you ever feel like that? I mean, when I first got into the things of God, I would play my Christian music all day and, you know, pray in the Spirit and listen to my teaching tapes. And it was, they were tapes back then. Now they're something else. I don't even know what they are. But... Uh, <laughs> Downloads, that's what it is, downloads. And uh, I was just, oh, so spiritual. Then all my kids would come home from school, and I was like, ah! <laughs> it's easy to be peaceful when there's no people around. Sickness can give you a lot of stress. Just circumstances, the world today, just all the negativity in the world today. So the bottom line is, is that if you want to have peace, you're going to have to want it really, really bad. 1 Peter 3.11 says that if you want peace, you have to seek it and pursue it. Seek means to go after with all your strength. Pursue it. Seek it and pursue it. It's not going to fall on you like ripe fruit falling off a tree. You have to really want it, and you have to be willing to change. Is there anybody here that would be willing to change anything you need to change just to have peace? Okay. Well, God saw your hand, so get ready. <laughs> but I love what it says in the Amplified Bible in 1 Peter 3.11. It says that if you want to enjoy life and have good days, good whether apparent or not, Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace. Well, the Amplified says, seek it eagerly. Do not merely desire peaceful relations with God, with your fellow man, and with yourself, but pursue and go after them. And so, you know, you're never going to have peace with other people or even peace with your circumstances if you don't have any peace with yourself. And that's really where most of our problems come from. A lot of people just don't like themselves. I know because I lived through that. And you know, when I first got started hearing preaching and hearing how we all need to love each other, I wanted to love people, but I just couldn't, and I didn't know what the problem was. And God taught me. He said, you, you can't love anybody else because you don't love yourself, and if you don't have love in you, you can't give it away. You can't give somebody something that you don't have. God's love is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit when we're born again. So we have love in us, but if you don't love yourself, you're not receiving that love. And I'm not talking about being in love with yourself and selfish and self-centered. I'm talking about loving the you that God created you to be. Amen? And if you start to love yourself and have peace with yourself, you'll be amazed at how easy it is to love other people and have peace with them. A lot of our problems start at home base. Amen? I started paying attention to what my peace stealers were. 
You should do that. If you want to have more peace, start paying attention to what it is that upsets you. What upsets you? What drives you to that point where you lose your peace? I don't do well if I have to hurry a lot. So I've learned to leave a little more time. I don't like being pressured. I don't like to feel like, oh, I'm going to, got to preach in three days and I don't have my messages yet. So I stay way ahead on all that stuff. And so if you get stressed out in the mornings trying to get out of the house, then go to bed a little bit earlier and get up a little bit earlier. Do a few things the night before that will help you the next morning so you have a little more time. The book that Pastor showed you is based out of Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and it is the whole answer to anxiety. You say the whole answer in one scripture? Yes. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. The more thankful you are, the less anxiety you have. Because the more thankful you are for what you have, the less upset you are about what you don't have. Amen? Present your request to God, and the peace that passes understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. So in that book, I do it in four parts. And I talk about the anxiety that every situation be thankful. Pray about everything. Your first response to everything should be to pray. And then peace, how valuable peace is. Amplified Bible about, it says in Colossians 3.15 that we should let peace be the umpire in our life. And we all know what an umpire is. He decides whether something's in or out. And we should let peace be the umpire in our life deciding whether something is in or it's out. If I can't do it with peace, then it's not from God. Amen? A foolish person recognizes his problem and refuses to do anything about it, the Bible says. They want somebody else to do it for them. Somebody else should fix this. Don't blame the world or the people in your world. Take responsibility for your own peace and start asking God, what can I do about this? Let me remind you about what I said in the beginning. Make a list of everything you're doing and then honestly look at each one and say, what kind of fruit is this bearing in my life? And even better, ask yourself what your motive is for doing it. If you're doing it just to keep somebody else happy, you know what I found out? I live a portion of my life, there was a church that we were going to, and I wanted to be in with this certain group of people. In order to do that, you had to have favor with this one certain woman, and in order to get that, you had to do everything she wanted you to do. And you know what I found out? When push came to shove, she didn't care anything about me. People who want to control you don't love you. They don't. Anybody who really loves you, if you say to them, you know, I would like to be able to do what you asked me to, but I just can't. I've got too much on my plate right now, or I don't have peace about doing it. If anybody really loves you, they should honor that and say, I don't want you to do anything you don't feel right about. Not get mad because you're not keeping them happy. You're, not a, you're, you're alive to obey God and love him not to keep everybody else on the planet happy. And you can't be a God pleaser and a people pleaser. You have to be one of the two. Personal stress worldwide is now at near record levels. Near record levels. The highest it's been really since about World War II. So I decided to do a little research on this. And I found out that today, a suicide has now passed car crashes as the number one injury death in America. The number one injury death in America is now suicide. I, I read another statistic 
that the top seven stresses in life are, number one, your job, number two, money, three, health, relationships, poor diet, media overload, lack of sleep, and parking at Saddleback. <laughs> oh, I made up that last one, obviously. Maybe you could uh, identify with this. I got this note, Pastor Rick, a few weeks ago, I went to a doctor for uh, some chronic aches and pains that seem to be getting worse. I don't sleep well, and I live in a constant state of fatigue. I told my doctor that I started a business seven years ago that's become very, very successful, but I now must force myself to go in to work. I feel overwhelmed. I feel overloaded. So my doctor asked me to list the stresses in my life and then think up some possible ways to reduce those stresses and then write down a plan of attack. I'd like to know what the Bible says about stress management. I hope you're in the service today because today we're gonna to look at the classic text in the entire Bible on how to keep from stressing out. We've been in this series through the book of Philippians, and as we come to chapter four, Paul gives us in verses six to 13, the classic anti-stress management recipe. If you have a Bible, you can open to Philippians chapter four. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. Just pull out these notes. All the verses we're gonna look at are inside uh, your bulletin on this text passage uh, outline. Now, the key uh, to this is that this passage actually comes with a stress management guarantee. And it's not guaranteed by a doctor, it's guaranteed by God. So you really wanna pay attention to this one if you wanna lower the stress in your life. In verse seven, we have the promised guarantee. Here's what it says. If you do these things, you will experience God's peace. There you go. You will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. The Bible calls this the peace that passes understanding. How do you know when you have the peace that passes understanding? You're in a situation when you have no logical reason to be at peace, and you are. That's the peace that passes understanding. When you're in a situation where you're in total chaos, total meltdown, total stress, total tension, Everything is going wrong at the same time, and yet you're at peace inside. That is the peace that passes understanding. And God says, I guarantee this to you. If you do these things, you'll experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind could understand. His peace will keep your thoughts quiet and keep your heart at rest. Wouldn't you like that? To have your thoughts quiet and your heart at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. Now God promises a more peaceful, less stressed mind. Is anybody interested in this? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Now, you know that there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible, but with every promise, there is a premise. God says, if you do this, then I'll do this. There is a condition, and I want you to circle the premise for this promise. And it is those first several words. If you do these things, circle that. If you do these things, it's gonna keep you from stressing out. You will experience God's peace. His peace will keep your thoughts quiet, keep your hearts at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. If you do these things, what things? Well, that's what we're gonna look at today. And there specifically are five things that God says to do in this passage. He says, I want you to worry about nothing. I want you to pray about everything. I want you to thank God in all things. I want to keep you to keep your mind on good things. And I want you to be content in all things. Now we're gonna look at these in detail. So let's get right into it. If you're taking notes, here's the first step. If I want to keep from stressing out, number one, refuse to worry about anything. Refuse to worry about anything. Why? Because the number one source of stress in your life is not work. It is worry. You may be overworked, but it's more likely you are overworried. Work doesn't keep you up at night. Worry does. 
And most of you are over-worried. Now, God is very clear in the Bible what he thinks about worry. And that's the first verse. Verse six, the first part of the first verse, verse six, Philippians 4, it says this. Never worry about anything. Now, circle never and circle anything. Never worry about anything. Question, is there any wiggle room in that verse? <laughs> no. Is there any exception? No. Uh, is there any exemption? No. Is there any reason where God says, it's okay to worry in this circumstance? No. Never worry about anything. That's about as big a blanket statement as you can make. He says, in no circumstance, well, what about, no, never worry about anything. But what about, no, never worry about anything. But what about, no, never worry about anything. Now, now Jesus thought worry was such an important topic that he spent a major section of his most famous sermons called the Sermon on the Mount talking about worry. And in that Sermon on the Mount, he gives us the four reasons you should never worry about anything. You might wanna write these down. Number one, Jesus says about worry, worry is unreasonable. It's illogical, it is unreasonable, it doesn't make sense. In verse chapter, uh, Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says this. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink or about your body or what you wear. Is not life more important than food? And is not the body more important than clothes? He's saying, this is not logical. You got your priorities out of order. It's irrational. It's, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It's unreasonable. Now, why is worry unreasonable? Well, there's a couple reasons. First, because worry exaggerates the problem. It never makes a problem smaller. It always makes it bigger. Have you noticed somebody says something bad about you? The more you think about it, the bigger it gets. Or you got a problem you start worrying about it, the more you worry about it, does the problem shrink with your worry? No, it always gets bigger. Worry exaggerates, it's irrational, it's unreasonable. It makes it bigger, it grows the problem out of proportion. And not only does, is worry exaggerating your problem, worry doesn't work. It never has worked. It is worthless, it is stewing without doing, it doesn't make any difference in your life. You see, to worry about something you can't change is useless. And to worry about something you can change is stupid. Just go change it. In either case, worry is not the answer. Worry doesn't work. It's unreasonable. Second, uh, Jesus says worry is unnatural. It's unnatural. Why? Because in the entire universe, the only creations of God that worry are human beings. Birds don't worry, cows don't worry, dogs don't worry, cats don't worry. Cats create worries, but they don't worry. <laughs> worry is unnatural. What do I mean by that? Because you weren't born with it. There are no born worriers. You might think you are, but you're not. You're not a born worrier. You learned it. Worry is something you learn. Now, the good news is if you learn to worry, it can be, yeah, unlearned. Now, you learned it, and actually to get good at it, you gotta practice it. Some of you are pros at worry. You have practiced it so much. You are so good at worrying. You are, I mean, you get the PhD. If, you were, if they had Olympics on worry, you'd get a 10, okay? Because you have practiced it so much, but it's learned. Worry is not natural. No baby is born worrying. They pick it up from everybody else. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns and Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? If anybody's on God's welfare program, it's birds. They don't do anything except birdie things. <laughs> tweet, that's it. Well, I tweet, but maybe, uh, maybe they tweet too. <laughs> Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap. But he says, your heavenly Father feeds them. Notice your heavenly Father. He's not talking about the bird's heavenly Father. He's saying your heavenly Father. Now, if God is your heavenly Father and you are his child, children get special privileges. And children of royalty are treated royally. And he says, what are you worrying about? Birds don't worry and they're not even, God's not their father. God's their creator, but not their father. God's your father. Don't worry about it. He says, birds don't worry, animals don't worry. Verse 28 and 29, Jesus says, and why do you worry about clothes? And why do you worry about clothes? 
Look at the lilies of the field, the field lilies. They, they don't worry about theirs. Yet King Solomon in all his glory was never clothed as beautifully as they are. He's saying in all of God's creation, in the entire universe, only human beings worry. Animals don't worry, plants don't worry. We are the only thing God made that doesn't trust him. Your body wasn't designed to handle worry. It wasn't designed. When people say, I'm worried sick, they're telling the truth. And, and doctors say a lot of people could leave hospitals today if they knew how to get rid of guilt, resentment, and worry, because that's what puts most people in. And see, what I'm saying is, it's not so much what you eat, it's what eats you. It's what eats you that makes you sick. It's the worry in your life. It's not just unnatural, it's unhealthy, it causes all kinds of health problems. Let me show you a couple of verses up here on the Bible, on the screen, the Bible says this. Proverbs 12, 25, an anxious heart weighs a man down. Well, you know that one. And you feel like you're just pulled down by the worries. You know, the, the word worry actually comes from an old English word, which means to strangle or to choke. That's what worry comes from, to strangle or choke. And when every time you worry, you are strangling and choking the life out of your life. An anxious heart weighs a man down. Look at the opposite on here on the screen. Proverbs 14, 30 says, but a heart at peace gives life to the body. You wanna be healthier? You need to stop worrying. Never worry about anything. Why? It's unreasonable and it's unnatural. The third thing Jesus says, it's unhelpful. It's unhelpful. Worry cannot make you one inch taller. <laughs> Worry can't make you one inch shorter. Worry can't take 10 inches off my waist. If it could, it would have. <laughs> Worry cannot lengthen your life. It, it can shorten your life, though. We know that. Worry cannot change the past, and worry cannot control the future. All it does is make today suck. It messes up today. That's all it does. It doesn't change the past. It can't change control of the future. It just messes up today. It's kind of like sitting in a rocking chair. You expend a lot of energy, but you don't make any progress. You're just, it's, it's useless. The only thing that worry changes is you. It makes you miserable. Doesn't so, has never solved the problem. It's unhelpful. And then the fourth reason why the Bible says never worry about anything is because it's unnecessary. God says, what in the world are you worrying about? Don't you think I'm gonna take care of you? Don't you think I'm gonna meet your needs? I made you, I created you, I saved you, I love you, I put my spirit in you. Don't you think I'm gonna take care of your needs? It's unhelpful, but it's also unnecessary. There's no need to worry. Jesus says this in Matthew 6:30. You know, if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, think of all the beautiful flowers that are never seen by human beings, but God takes care of them. He said, if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he most surely care for you, oh, you of little faith? So you're as happy as you choose to be. If you're unhappy, it's because you're choosing to be unhappy. Don't blame your husband, your wife, or anybody else. It is a choice. And so is worry. Worry is a choice. Nobody's holding a gun to your head. You don't have to worry. And so the first step in stress management is to refuse to worry about Anything. Why? Because it's unhelpful, unreasonable, unnatural, and unnecessary. The Bible says this, 1 Peter 5, 7. Unload all your worries on God, since he is looking after you. And I love that word unload, because literally in the original Greek, it means to just drop. It's not like take a, a, a long throw of it, like, like you're throwing a baseball or throwing a rock across a lake. It just says unload. It means let it go. Let it go. And God says, you know all those things you're stressing about this morning, all those things you're anxious, you're worried, you're fearful, you're uptight about, let it go, let it go. Never worry about anything, because it's not gonna do any good anyway. So what do you do anyway? You do the next step, and that's the second part of this verse. First part of verse six says, never worry about anything. The second part is talk to God about everything. That's the second step. You talk to God about everything. Don't panic, pray. Don't worry, worship. 
Stop talking to yourself about all the stuff that stresses you out and start talking to God. Talking to yourself won't do anything, but talking to God will. He's saying, talk to God about everything. This is the second part of this verse, Philippians 4, 6. Never worry about anything. Instead, in every situation, let God know what you need in your prayers and in your requests. And, and, and by the way, God is, since God has promised to care for you, if it's not worth praying about, it's not worth worrying about. He says, talk to God about everything. God knows what you need in your prayers. You know, when I was a kid, anytime I had a need in my life, I would uh, I'd go talk to my dad and say, Dad, I need this. And sometimes it was something that cost something. It was expensive. And I said, Dad, I need this. I, I, I can distinctly remember that not once as a kid, when I said, Dad, Dad, I need this, never once did I worry about where my father was going to get the money. <laughs> never once. Because that's not my job. It's my dad's job to figure out where the money is going to come from. It was my job as a kid, as a child, to simply ask. It's not your job to figure out how God's going to do it. It's your job to ask. To ask your heavenly father, Father, I need this help. You see, when you worry instead of asking, when you worry instead of asking, you're acting like an atheist. Worry is practical atheism. That's what it is. It's, it's acting like I don't have a heavenly father in my life. It's acting like God doesn't exist. It's acting like I'm a spiritual orphan. Worry is practical atheism. God says, I'll take care of you. It's acting like God can't be trusted. Now, here's what the Bible says. Look in your outline, James 4, 2. You do not have because what? You do not ask. You do not ask God. So here's the second key to stress management. Worry less, ask more. Worry less, ask more. Instead of worrying, pray. Worry about nothing, pray about everything. He said, well, I don't want to bother God with this little bitty, tiny little thing. There's nothing tiny to God. Every problem in your life is tiny to God. There's no big problems in your life. There are no little problems in your life because all of them are tiny to God. Now, here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, 32. Since God did not spare even his own son, Jesus, but gave him up for us all. He died on the cross for us. Won't he give us Christ? Who, won't he who gave us Christ also give us everything else we need? What's he saying here? Follow the logic. Your biggest problem is getting into heaven because heaven's perfect and you're not, and neither am I. I stopped batting a thousand about breath number three. And so God came up with plan B. He came to earth in human form. And he said, I'll live a perfect life and I'll die for you and you can get into heaven on my ticket. It's grace. I don't work it. I don't earn it. I don't deserve it. I don't buy it. It's just grace. I told you last week that one of my mentors was Peter Drucker. And I asked Peter one time, Peter, at what point did you step across the line and accept a relationship with Jesus? He said, you know, Rick, the day that I understood grace for the first time, I realized I'm never getting a better deal. There was no way I'm getting into heaven on my goodness. I'm, I'm not good enough. It says, if God did not spare his own son, but gave him for us, won't he give us everything that Christ has given to us? Won't he give us everything else we need? If God solved my biggest problem, everything else is small by comparison. 